Web Systems, Week 3, The Web and Security, Part 2, Security Services. In Part 1, we talked about the different types of threats out there and what we can do to solve these threats. In Part 2, we're going to look at confidentiality. We're going to look at integrity and non-repudiation. All of these services use encryption techniques. Confidentiality. We're going to use encryption to protect the privacy of our information. The first service, and probably the most common one when people think of security, is encryption. The idea of encryption is to basically make sure that something is converted to something that people can't read unless they're authorized to. So here's some examples. A classic technique um, to basically encrypt in the old days was a, was a concept called scrambling. Uh, it's a very trivial type of encryption. And here's an example of ROT13. Basically, ROT13 is also known as a Caesar cipher. And it's yes, it's been around since the days of the Romans, a long time ago. So here's an example. The butler did it, might get translated to this. G U R the butler did it. You need to try to work out what the encryption rule is. So I'll give you a few seconds to think about that and see if you can work out the pattern. Well, pause, continue your wish. What the ROT13 algorithm does is simply shifts the characters by 13. Assuming A is 1 and N is 13, B could be 2 and O is 14, and so on and so on. What happens at the end when we hit Z? It goes back to A, so N becomes A. So let's try this out. H, that becomes U. H becomes U. E becomes R. L becomes Y. And O, oh dear, O is not here. So let's take a look. O becomes B. So let's take O becomes B. Good news. A very simple algorithm. The previous example is an example where we shared two secrets. The secrets we actually shared were the actual key, which is 13, and the algorithm, which is called a rotation algorithm. So the password would be passed was 13 if we all knew it was a rotation theory algorithm. If I actually said the password was 5, for example, we rotate everything by 5, so A becomes E, for example, we simply know the word 5, and we can pass it on. That's actually a password in this particular case. Of course, we could have incredibly complex passwords like password or secret or 1234. Again, it's symmetric, you share the secret. So, the biggest issue is, what happens if I need to exchange? This is the killer. Good example. I have a document. I have a document called <coughs> exam, and I encrypt it. And I encrypt it using a password 1234. And I want to pass it to my tutors. And I want to pass it to my tutors, all three of them. Of course, I trust them, totally, but because I might say, hey, the password is 1234, somebody might listen. And that person might hear the actual password, 1234. If they ever get a copy of the exam, even though it's encrypted, they can now read it. The problem is, this 1234 has been shared, this password, and I can't stop it. Once it's out there, everybody could hypothetically know it. What do we do in this situation? One way to solve this is a technique called public key cryptography. It's using mathematics. The idea is each party has two keys, public and private key, and the, the two halves are linked together by an algorithm of some kind. And typically, a good example of an algorithm is called the RSA one, which is based on prime numbers and factoring. So here's an example of two halves of a key. Typically, you might have a private key, that's PVT, that picture, and the public key. The two, when separate, don't mean anything, but when together, form one single shape. In this case, it could be the actual algorithm itself. 
that's a typical example. It's very simplistic, but it's very complicated in terms of mathematics. Basically, the idea is you encrypt with one half of the key and decrypt with the other. So I encrypt with that half, and then I can decrypt with the other half. The single beauty about this concept is it happens to work with all the four major security capacities that we mentioned earlier. For example, you can authenticate with it. Basically, you encrypt with your private key and decrypt with the public key. So you have the two halves, it's asymmetrical. With privacy, you encrypt with, your, with the receiver's public key and only the receiver can decrypt it with their public key. Data integrity, basically you can encrypt it and if you ever try to change the contents, it won't decrypt, so you know something's wrong. And the same thing with non-repudiation. Did I pay or not? There's another way of checking, because only you have your private key. Everybody else can see your public key. So if you encrypt with your public key, basically people can double check that it was encrypted with your public key. Simple as that. And this is the essence of web security. I believe most of you have probably seen SSL. You probably know it as HTTPS. And what happens is your browser will pop up with something that says, hey, this is encrypted or not. Usually a little um, lock in the top left-hand corner or the, the bar goes green or some indication. This has a really interesting feature. It provides the whole CIA stack. Confidentiality, you can prevent interception. It's got integrity, stops modification, and not always, but it's two-way authentication. Usually, it verifies the owner of a website. Part of the SSL algorithm uses a thing called digital signatures, which I'll talk about in a moment. It actually uses both types of encryption algorithms. It uses a public key cryptography. Um, basically, your browser has half a key in it, and the web server has the other part of a key and they share each other. What actually happens is they have a handshake and they agree on a encryption algorithm and they actually pass a secret to each other. It's a once-off key which is only used for that session. And a good example is to look at the video. If you've got some time, click on this video. It gives you a good overview of how SSL actually works. I'll let you look at it at your own leisure. Now let's take a quick look at the techniques to provide integrity for our information. Another technique used by the web to stop a security attack, especially uh, modification and uh, non-repudiation, technique called hashing. The idea is you put a mathematical algorithm against a piece of code or data or something like that and basically it ensures that data is not modified. So let's take a look at how it actually works. The idea is you do a thing like a sum, for example, a checksum. You add up the characters. Remember, A could be 1, B could be 2. Simply add them all up and you have a magic number at the end. And then you encrypt that number with the, with the sender, with your own private key. And the receiver uses your public key to decrypt it. And they use the same algorithm. We'll do a checksum. We'll add, for example, we add the letters up. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, whatever. And then use the public key to match that number. If the number's not the same as when you sent it and what they've worked out to be, something's been modified. It's a very good example of hashing and digital certificates. And we typically use this for things like secure email. We don't use this at UTS, um, but theoretically if you're sending emails between, say, lawyers, you can actually secure your email. You can digitally sign email. And your clients would actually get something saying, this was sent from Chris Wong. They decrypt it using my public key and say, yes, this is correct. Or it's been signed correctly. Um, if you're fortunate enough to use um, Adobe Acrobat, you can actually sign documents electronically. And Adobe has that option when you create. And even when you receive emails, you can say, I've received it, for example. It's also used very by Microsoft when you install software, it'll say, do you want to accept, do you want to install this or not? If the code has not been signed by Microsoft, it will give you a prompt saying, 
this software is not being signed by Microsoft, do you want to install yes or no? Microsoft used that hashing to stop people distributing fake copies of software like a fake copy of Microsoft Office for example. Non-repudiation is the last security service to talk about. It's basically a guarantee that you can't deny that you signed a transaction. You saw in the previous slides about hashing that can use this to sign documents or sign emails. Well, it's easy enough to create a private key by yourself. You can self-sign, but that doesn't mean that that is actually accepted and it can be faked. So you need to get your signature signed by what's known as a certification authority. For example, a company called RSA. These people will verify your identity and will then sign your signature to say that a third party has checked that you are who you are. And typically you'll find that you are required to provide a company identification or personal identification like a driver's license or passport for this third party company to prove who you are. In fact, if you pay tax using non-repudiation techniques, the government itself is the authority that signs your digital certificate.